Hello. Would you like to introduce yourself, James? Hi, everyone. My name is James Wilmot. I am Director of Careers at the Priory Learning Trust. So I'm a careers advisor at Priory School. Um, I help out at World School, King Alfred School, and I do tons of work with the primary schools in our trust as well. Wow. Amazing. And how long have you been doing that for? Oh, man. Um, about eight years, I think. I oh, joined, wow. I joined here eight years ago. And before that, I was four years at Western College on apprenticeships. And before that, I was 100 years in the recruitment industry. <laughs> and, don't know that old and you just answered my question because one of the things that people that somebody said never go to a careers advisor at school because they're careers advisors at school and who wants to be one of them you know what do they know about careers but I suppose straight away you've answered that by just saying about recruitment and having an understanding and that background to recruitment which must be such a bonus for your job Definitely. Um, I use it every every minute of every day. I've still always got my employer head on because that's where the students are going inevitably. Um, yeah. But yeah, when I, when I started here eight years ago, one of the first things I did was I sent a, like a, a questionnaire out on LinkedIn to see what people thought of careers advisors. And it was awful. Um, yeah, <laughs> everyone, everyone's got a terrible careers advisor story. Yeah. Um, so I, I decided to chuck that right out and, um, and kind of... <laughs> Re redesign what it means to be a careers advisor and, and what it means for a school to have a careers program to do something different that was built on solid foundations before by Liz, my predecessor. But yeah, we wanted to do something new and far more interesting. So tell us what what does that what does it mean to be a careers advisor and to be a good careers advisor? It means um, you've got to do tons of stuff. It's not <laughs> just about random one to ones with students tucked away in a school somewhere like many careers advisors are still kind of don't even have a home in a school they're like under the stairs um and that's that's shocking you gotta if you're gonna because you, we're outside of um timetable and curriculum we don't have a timetable we don't have a curriculum so we're not a teacher um so we've got to make our presence felt as strongly and as positively as you can otherwise you just get forgotten and shoved aside um the nice thing in this trust is that I'm shoulder to shoulder with um, the directors of maths, English and science. So the trust holds careers in the same esteem as core subjects. So, yeah, it's about marketing, getting the message out to parents and carers, making sure that the staff know what's going on, appealing to the students without trying to be down with the kids. Um, because that's never going to work. Um, <laughs> And just yeah. to do good stuff, just to <laughs> just do good stuff like trips out, bring people in like you guys did a little while ago. It's about normalizing the outside world for the students in school and and bust them out of their comfort zones a bit. But does that also bust you guys out of your comfort zone? Because obviously you come across, I mean, I, somebody asked me if I could do some mentoring somewhere and it was like they really couldn't organise themselves to sort it all out. And I noticed Somerset have asked for mentors for business mentors and and they've made it so complicated somebody like me who runs a company who and 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 mm -hmm. I just can't be bothered to get caught up with it it's just messy and they're making it messy so it, I suppose my question is is that do you guys make it messy or do you make it simple or what you know what's the thing what's the kind of way you work we make it very simple. Um, my philosophy is little and often. So we get employers in and speakers in like the interesting assemblies we're running here on Tuesdays for year eight at the moment. Five minutes. Um, it's, otherwise, it becomes laborious for you guys because you've got day jobs, two, mm. three, four, five day jobs. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't demand too much from employers. Um, we um, might spring students out to do a quick trip to a couple of businesses. We might bring people in to speak in assemblies or to help out in a class to pass on the knowledge. We've got a couple of mentors that come in. One chap, Rod, he's coming in tomorrow afternoon for 10 minutes on a Friday afternoon tutor time because that's the day when he works from home. And that's yeah. the day that the student would probably really benefit from having a bit of decompression for the weekend. Um, so, yeah, Rod's going to come in for his second week tomorrow um, for 10 minutes, have a cuppa, have a chat with the student in question. Um, and he's making a real positive difference. So it's about managing expectations. Um, I remember the first the first couple of weeks I was here, I, I, I scored a, a pathologist to come in to do a, um, a, a guest speaker spot in a science class. And I thought I was the bee's knees because I was easier to please then. Um, <laughs> so I got with Ian and the science teacher was like, right, then see, see you in an hour. And she was like, what? And I was like, what? Um, so we had an hour to fill. And it was awful because she wasn't a teacher and neither am I. Um, yeah. We made it work. And she's a she's a teacher here now. In fact, she's ahead of you, um, which worked perfectly. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, little and often, that's how you make it work. No, don't ask too much. 
Yeah, I I'm, and I know I've been interviewed by kids at King Alfred's and they've pulled me in. And what I thought was going to be 10 minutes ended up three quarters of an hour, which wasn't a problem for me at all. I'm, I'm more than happy to put that time in. But actually, I really enjoyed it. It was really good fun. And, and I believe they enjoyed it as well. But it, I think there's a there's a good and a bad. It can be really, I'm sure you've had disasters. I'm absolutely sure you've had people that are rubbish. Yeah. You can't say those, can you? <laughs> My colleague Jody across the office is laughing, waiting for me to disclose some stories. Um, we've had a couple of clunkers because, you know, like like you said about comfort zones earlier, we push ourselves out of the comfort zones all the time. I'll I'll cook up a scheme for my my team across the trust, and I'm saying I say right, I think we should do this, and they're thinking, oh god, again. Um, but it is. It's about if if we're there as role models for our students to bust comfort zones, to step into a bit of fear and have a bit of fun, um, then we got to lead by example. But yeah, we, we've had a clunker or two. I got a guest speaker in who wanted to talk to some students about prepping for a job interview and it was the most cringe experience I've ever seen in my life in front of 250 children. He thought he was being really funny. Um, it could have been ironically funny, but it wasn't. Um, it was terrible. Um, and um, yeah, I always vet um, my guest speakers before they come in from that point onwards because you know, <laughs> you learn by experience. And that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Fair enough. So when you look at a young person and you think, oh, do you know what? Um, how can I help you? Do you ask them the question or do you make assumptions? Never make assumptions. Um, you've got high achieving students. Yeah. You've got students with SCN, high anxiety. You've got a million kids in the middle that are, are never get go home with glowing reports, never go home with scathing reports. So they're, they're in the middle there. The, the question we ask our students when we get them in for a conversation, careers interview, that's old school. We ask the question, what's the story? Um, what's the story? It's a, it's, a, it's a conversation starter. Some students are like, what do you mean? And they're on the back foot. And then we can just say, you know, wh where are we with stuff? What's happening? We're going to kick you out of school in eight weeks, eight months time. You know, wh what are you going to do next? Um, but yeah, we ask open questions. And everyone that walks in the door, it's a brand new day. And irrespective of behavior, attitude to work. Um, yeah, what's the story? And, and let them lead the show. And with a bit of prompting. Um, you know, we have, like Jody and I today at Priory, we had 30 kids in, year 11 students in for progression one-to-ones. Every conversation, what's the story? And they spill. It's great. It's lovely listening yeah, yeah. to them. Really good. Love it. Do you, have you got kids of your own? Hmm. How old are they? Roe is 18 and he's year two A-levels at SGS College because he loves the rugby. Um, and Henry is 15 and he's year 10 at Broad Oak um, and he does not love the rugby. Ah, very Two very different young men then. Yeah, completely. So have you found that that's helped your career develop? Um, what, having the boys? Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of. I don't know. I, I kind of leave them alone. Because they, they know I'm there and, and I've got the toolkit if they need it um, and the contacts and everything else. But they're on their own journey and they know I leave them be. And um, I might intervene every now and again and ask a question or prompt. Um, but that's the weird thing about careers advice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the curtain back. It is it's such a significant placebo. Um, it's, the, it's the knowledge that the safety net is there that actually gives the students and the young people the courage to step forward and do things yeah. nine times out of 10, they never need the safety net. So we're there, we're there, we're, we're signposters and opportunity providers. We don't make them do anything. They do it on their own. Um, and yeah, I think that's taught me actually so close to home that I'm, you know, I'm not going to batter my kids with careersy stuff. Um, but it's about providing a positive role model to them just as someone in work who loves their job. I think that's the important thing that my children see is that, yeah, they see that I love what I do with some frustrations um, and I want them to remember me and my job as something that, you know, their dad enjoyed what they did. Um, it breaks my heart when I hear, you know, some people are just really sad in their employment and it spills into the kids. Yeah, yeah that's, it is a really good point because if you don't love what you do, you know, it, it, it makes it kind of pointless. You know, what what is the point of going to work? If you just go into work just to to earn money and to, to do something, then it's it's a really sad existence, isn't it? 
It is. And those choices are limited with many people. You know, a lot of people I know do, do a job they don't enjoy, but they get paid very well to do it. Um, and that's fine. That, that's that's that, you know, it's give and take. But some people have neither. They don't enjoy it and they don't get paid well um, because they're in a they're in a situation which, you know, is difficult to get out of. So that that hurts. And when we work with some students, when we are aware of maybe some generational unemployment and we're bending their ear about work experience placements and college taste todays and things you know that that, that th those points are completely out of context because they're going to go home and talk about reaching out to a business um and no one in their family and network works so it's not going to happen so we have to um adjust and pivot on that one and help them out in different more creative ways and cheat sometimes um of course but yeah, yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, it is really sad for a, a lot of families out there who are working hard, um, two, three, four, five jobs, um, and um, just making ends meet. For sure. How uh, do you? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, how how do you cope with kind of new industries and and you know students coming in saying you know I want to I, I don't know I want to work in in with AI and things mm. like that. How how do you how do you kind of keep yourself updated on? jobs and job opportunities that perhaps didn't exist not only five years ago but perhaps six months ago it's a strange one isn't it there's that weird kind of adage that's been bouncing around for the last 10 years that in five years time 12 20 percent of all jobs don't exist yet and all this kind of thing yeah <laughs> and, and I, did i keep on top of emerging kind of industries and there's cpd within what we do and larger okay. networks we can be a part of but it's strange we actually in many ways for some students we we actually push that forward for them because many young people still think in very linear traditional sense with job roles so they think i am a practical person who enjoys being physical um i don't like you know sitting down for extended periods of time so i am going to be a construction worker um but then we may suggest other pathways um, that they haven't never even considered because they think construction worker, hair and beauty, childcare, engineering, IT, still in quite broad strokes. So it's about unpicking that a little bit and encouraging them to explore different pathways that they might not have you know, considered before. We're doing a trip to Bridgewater College in a few weeks for agriculture because we've got a bunch of students here who, um, in actual fact, they want to be physical, they want to do practical things for a job but they've never been on a farm before. So we're going to take okay. them back to Wellington and then hopefully bring them through thatches on the way back for an orchard tour so they can see that they can do things that are physical, manual, without construction. Sounds good. It's broadening their horizons, really, isn't it? I, I, yeah. I know my youngest son is a, a music producer and DJ, and I remember his music teacher, and we've talked about this before, haven't we? With, mm absolutely had no consideration for the fact he'd always wanted to do that and he's a very successful music producer and dj and um you know the attitude that he experienced at school from some was really really negative and i think for some young people if they get that kind of approach it absolutely knocks their confidence hmm. you know like why would you want to be a farmer you've never been on a farm type thing that you know, and challenging that, which it sounds like you're doing, is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Challenging stereotypes is really important because it's and and we did a we did a, a college taste today um, back in July with some year ten students, and I did some kind of shout out posters afterwards to encourage future engagement. And afterwards, I put them together, and it's like, wow, those are so gender stereotypical. And I kicked myself for it, but it just happened. Um, so despite our best efforts, yeah, gender stereotypes do come into play. And the, the, the influence from family and friends is really kind of overwhelming as well sometimes. Yeah, um, but yeah it, it's a strange one because there is, for young people, there's a sense of entitlement and a short distance to travel for things. I want to be a midwife, therefore, I, you know, when can I be a midwife? It's like, well, that's like a lot of, a lot of years away. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's about the, the distance to travel. But also I'm mindful that if everyone came in asking me to, that they're going to tell me they're going to be an astronaut, then that's going to be a lot of difficult conversations I've got to have to manage their expectations. So it's about expanding those horizons, exploring alternatives, just to make sure there's a safety net for the safety net for the safety net. But is that realistic? Because kids, you know, kids get disappointed, adults get disappointed, we fail, we, mm -hmm. you know, it's part of being a human. Mm -hmm. So is it that safety net, safety net, safety net, is that re a realistic model to work from? 
Hmm, interesting. I like to think that even in my role, I've got a safety net for a safety net for a safety net. Um, yeah. Because in my recruitment hat, head back in the day, I always had like backups and alternative pathways and routes. We all get knocked back on stuff, absolutely. And that's, in actual fact, the year 10 program for work experience, that's a classic real world example of how that can work. So often students will come to us partway through finding a placement and they'll say, well, I spoke to five people or two people or one person. Um, and they said, email me and they never got back to me. It's like, okay, well, that's fine. Well, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. So actually two thirds of the work experience experience is finding the placement. It's not taking it personally when someone just doesn't get back to you um, or um, they just say, no, um, we, you know, we help the students dust themselves off and persevere and persevere gets to a point where we might cheat slightly in, behind the scenes. So I might prime an employer to make sure that, you know, I maybe know someone that I can recommend to that student to reach out to at a certain point. But yeah, um, the, the world is real and the world is tough. Um, we also promote the the real business of having a, a network, a, a, a support network around you. Those are the, those are the emotional safety nets. So it's surrounding yourself with people that can help you, with positive people that want to see you thrive rather than the, the faux friends in school that often push you down because it makes them feel better. Um, so we kind of very much encourage that message of, you know, step forward with people that are stepping forward, help each other out, refer work experience placements to each other. We do a thing in assembly where I'll say, okay, 300 of you in the room, who wants to work in construction for work experience? 20 hands go up. Okay, hands up, who of you have got family members that work in construction? 20 hands go up. Yeah. You guys need to talk um, because you're in the room right here. Um, and that works really well. So yeah, it's, it's the real world. That's a great way of doing we, it. We, we prep them best we can to create networks and support networks, yeah. It, and and I, I mean, we've often had, we've like at the rehab in Burnham, we've had like somebody pick up the phone and go, is there any chance? Because they've left it a bit late, they want to do social care, or they want to do this, or they want to do that. And I can honestly say, all of the students that have ever come to us have been absolutely out of this world. Amazing young people that have given so much and worked so so hard. And we we always give them a project. So that's your project. Get on yeah. with it. You know, this is what we do. And and they've you know um. Funnily enough, you meet them later on in life. So you might meet them in church or you might meet them walking down the street or wherever in any lots of different circumstances. And they always remember that experience. And I think it's really, as an employer, it's important to recognize that. But mm. it's also as a student to recognize that too, that those people have become part of your life. We've got one student that, oh my gosh, I don't know how old she is now. She's got to be, well, she's, she's, nearly at married stage, you know, and, and having children and various other bits and pieces. And she came to us completely out of the blue. She was on a social care. She was just about to start a social care course through the school. She was doing some dabbling with it through the school and then came to us for a placement and then came back to us when she was at college. Brilliant, lovely young woman, lovely, absolutely lovely young woman. And has we've literally followed her through her career. And it, as an employer, it's really nice to see that and to be part of that. And I think sometimes people always forget that young people grow up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they become adults and they remember what you've done and what you haven't done. Regret is a powerful emotion. You know, we try and help everyone, but we can't help everyone because it's not their time. Um, some students will go off to work experience and it won't go well because of the choices they make. I, uh, as much as I hope that every student that goes out to do work experience reflects on it like yours has, um, but some I, I think will in a few years time think, yeah, I, I, I blew that yeah. um, and, I, and, I, and I'm not doing that again. Even if it's advice passed on to their children in 20 years time, yeah. you know, it's, in, it's an experience and it's that visceral experience that is curriculum busting and timetable smashing these kids when they leave school when we ask them what was the biggest important things you did in school and many of them don't don't tell my principals this but um many will say it's not about the exams and the grades it's about oh that day when you got 40 employers in and they did the interviews or that that week when we did the thing work experience yeah that great thanks for remembering um but um but yeah it's that kind of visceral experience that busts them so far out of their comfort zone that's what they really remember. Yeah. And we can't do any of that without the support of employers um, because everything else is just 
m myself and my team talking about stuff. Um, and that's not visceral. That's horrifically boring. Um, so it's we, 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 can't, we can't do it without without our stakeholders, without our friends, without our uh, favors to cash in. We can't do it without LinkedIn. Of course. Do you, do you ever get the um, that bit where some people in your industry, and I'm separating you from the teaching industry, obviously, but some people that do what you do can be quite judgmental about certain careers because I mean I have a very unusual career so I'm a I, I run and own a well I don't run it that much now because I've got a team that do it but a drug and alcohol rehab and immediately that puts people's be, create a judgment from that and I think that can prevent people from thinking well why wouldn't I send a student to that place because mm -hmm. of that Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that everybody in the drug and alcohol rehab probably behave better than they do at school, but you know that's irrelevant. You know what I'm saying? But people, I think some adults have judgment, and you know you could say that about any career. But do you find that that happens in your work? In in my profession, I'd like to think that my peers are open-minded. I think mm -hmm. some teachers, because they necessarily haven't worked in outside of education. And yeah. I think that's a risk. But actually, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to backtrack. I think some of my peers is at risk of that as well, because they've been careers advisors for a long time um, yeah. and they don't necessarily ha have the outreach that myself and my team do and speak to people like you lovely people and and, and look outwards. I think many there's always the risk in education to look inwards too much. Yeah. Um, and, and like you mentioned about, you know, your, your, your center with, you know, safeguarding measures in place and we do health and safety checks um, and everyone signs forms and everyone's expectations are managed. Yeah, um, absolutely. Unless, the, you know, unless there's a risk, then I want our students to go out and, you know, experience the, it's, it's funny sometimes when I speak to people who've been in academia for a while and I'd still surprise myself that I'm in academia because I never thought I would be. Um, <laughs> they refer to the world of work. What do you and, and they'll say, can you bring someone in from the world of work? It's like, wow, OK, yeah, let me go through the, the, the portal into the world of work and I'll bring someone through the gateway. Um, and yeah, the world of work is a, it's a mystical place for many people. They're, they're completely bamboozled by it. But to myself and, and my team and many other careers advisors, it's like and, and I make a big deal of it and I make it sound like it's a massive chore. But I'll pop a help shout out on LinkedIn. And I'll get six people in um, within the hour. And it's like witchcraft to others. But teaching a class of 12 year olds, that's like witchcraft to me. I couldn't do that. No, yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no way. I've got the emotional intelligence for that, um, the tolerance or the knowledge. Um, so, yeah, each to their own. I think that's exactly it. What What's the has the view on um, every student going to university changed? Because yeah. the reason I say that is I'm I'm 32 soon. So, you know. 15 odd years ago when I was at school there was such a massive push to go to university and I I sort of started my own little IT business when I was about 14 so when I was 15 16 I kind of knew what I wanted to do and I, I will never forget um, the the deputy head teacher of my school did an assembly about careers I think her I think part of her role was was kind of careers and employment and kind of succession planning and I always remember she picked out a number of students around what they were going to do and I always remember her in this assembly telling me in my entire year that I had earned enough money from my IT business to go to university and I sat there thinking I've never once said I want to go to university where has this come from and I realized later, and, and I still realize it now later on in life, that actually her job was to push as many people as she could to university. Mm. Has, has that changed? I bloody hope so. Um, <laughs> it, it has in my manner, that's for sure. Um, yes, it has. Um, with the, and this is the nice thing from my previous job on within apprenticeships, um, it's helped a great deal. Um, yeah. And even when I worked in recruitment, I worked with like graduates and junior level staff without a degree. Um, I could have schmoozed the hobnobs, but I, I couldn't be bothered. Um, I, I looked after the people that needed help. Um, so yeah, my kind of career has seeked into the development of um, county university offers. So we're looking at higher and degree level apprenticeships. I know they're growing slowly, but apprenticeships are still a valid way of building skills and qualifications beyond school, college or sick form. It's not necessarily suitable for someone straight out of school. In actual fact, I'm far more professionally and as a father, far more comfortable with a 17 or an 18 year old going out to the world of work um, on an apprenticeship um, 
because they've got that little bit more life experience, a little bit more maturity, they might have a driving license, they can handle things a little bit stronger, you know, they're not hanging on half term. Um, but um, but yeah, definitely the, the university application numbers are lowest in the Southwest in the country. Um, that's something that is is strange because we've got great universities on our doorstep. We have, um, yeah. But um, but yeah, with the advent of you of apprenticeships, with cost of living, and myself and my colleague Jody were on a CPD discussion with other practitioners last week about this, and cost of living has really hit a lot of families, and they just don't, they can't even process student finance. It was, a, it's always been a challenge before, um, but they can't even process the concept of that amount of debt. Um, and also there was a press release, I think it was in the Telegraph over the weekend, shamefully and really tragically that a lot of young people are giving up on career aspirations because they don't feel they'll ever get there. And wow. I think that's, that's a real shame. That because is very sad. Yeah. It's one thing trying and not getting there, but another thing, not trying at all. I think, wow, that's a learned helplessness from the last few years that I think is a generational issue that we really have to work double to, to boost the young people up. But university is a fantastic offer. We've got many brilliant ones on our doorstep and further afield, but we have also got major businesses and small and medium sized businesses looking for people that, you know, they can train up and put them on a very similar pathway, um, just with a different approach. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, but I, um, I love helping people like that comes that come to our organization that might not be fully equipped to do the job, but what they are is they're willing. And I think that's the bit, the willingness just, you know, is fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, some people we've had to say, I'm sorry, but you're not suitable after a period of time because they're not, we've got a lot of safeguarding issues. We've got lots of that kind of stuff that you've got to look into, but primarily I love seeing that. I love seeing people develop and it's, and do, is it, do other people love seeing other people develop? Because they develop above you. They always do eventually. There's, you know, somebody that's come in that's the, I'm not, talk, I don't like levels, but somebody that's talk, come in with not so much knowledge. And then before you know it, they've left you because they've gone to do higher things somewhere else. And I love that. I absolutely mm. love that. I think, I think, you know, I think for most of us, I'd like to think that's kind of built into all of us as, as good people and professionals. We want, I, I would my my vision of my colleagues and my team and my peers is is to have to run to keep up with them um yeah. because they're going to come out with brand new amazing things yeah. um yeah i think i think in any kind of positive business in any kind of management mentality i think that's anything else is is weird um but i think yeah um i think loads of lots of employers i work with when they come in here when they have our students they try and they try and offer them apprenticeship roles at the end of year 10 after work experience <laughs> saying come back in a year and i'll take you um yeah. because they see they see themselves in those young people they see the potential yeah. in those young people um some businesses unfortunately i think can be a little bit myopic they want they want to train up yet they've got a skewed vision of what that is they they have this image of you know, advertising an apprenticeship role, expecting a queue of almost Victorian street urchins queuing around the, around the block looking for the opportunity with a cap in their hand. But that doesn't happen because in actual fact, the candidate is the discerning candidate these days because there are so many apprenticeship Options. opportunities out there. Yeah. yeah, that if an employer pays them a meager wage and offers um, a, a, a sterile, austere environment, you're going to be disappointed. Um, I'm not saying going dr dropping your standards down to appeal to a large demographic there's a there's a sweet spot in the middle but um but yeah i i see i see our our leavers having a blast with employers work experience students having a blast with employers uh, two great examples i'll give you is last year our year 12s at king alfred went out to do work experience um some of them struggled to find um opportunities in legal and architecture which are pretty hard nuts to crack um, but they use LinkedIn and they got local placements. They did brilliantly. I caught up with them last week because they're looking at doing degree level apprenticeships rather than university group. And the legal work experience person has been working, carried on working at that practice part time since, since wow. like last, you know, last spring. And so is the architect. Um, and both employers have said, we'll take you when you finish your A levels, we will take you um, if we can figure out a way to make it work on the apprenticeship side. And that's that's what fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That is brilliant. So, so do, I, I've always had a confusion as, as an employer around apprenticeships because I've seen how other people have been exploited. It's been an apprenticeship 
but not actually going to college and not getting any education and they just see them as cheap labor and I really dislike that I think that's not correct but how do how do employers how do you get employers to embrace the apprenticeship scheme because we've never done it and mm. partly because I think it's ignorance and it is complicated mm. it's it can be complicated um again rewinding when I worked in a, a, yeah. a college on apprenticeships we had a sales team that would go out to employers expressing an interest and it was it was quite dark sometimes some employers would be like right so what's what's the minimum wage mm. um and, and they and they do their sums and they say all right yeah i'll have four um, and it's like okay well you could have two and and pay them significantly more that they could afford to live on um so some employers approach it from a collateral point of view and i think that's really unwise because you're never going to come out you're never going to come out winning on that um many employers they've heard about apprenticeships it's hard for some businesses to kind of um process how it works because most apprenticeships don't have day release to college at all um there's only some areas um where you go into college or do a block release to a college or a university for the technical stuff um the majority are full-time in the workplace with contact and involvement from a training provider which kind of links in with the employer and the, um, and the apprentice to make sure that standards are reached and the necessary skills are developed so it is underwritten from a quality point of view so you can't just take on an apprentice in name only as a job and not have a training provider or a college input. There has to be that element. If there isn't that element, then it's not an apprenticeship. It's but who, check, who checks that? I mean, who says, you know, when you've got some rogue employer that's employing, that's doing, implying that they're doing mm. an apprenticeship, and then they don't actually give them that kind of respect. The apprenticeship police? I don't know. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, there, there should be like, there should be a thing. Um, yeah, that's exploitation. Yeah. Um, I mean, some, Absolutely. some businesses pay far more than the apprenticeship minimum wage um, and they will employ someone and give them amazing training. But the, if, if they, there won't be a, a qualification or a underwritten standards off to one side there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that as long as someone's being paid at least the minimum wage for their age and they're and they're doing a you know a, fulfilling their job role um and everyone's happy um but yeah i don't know but that is, isn't that the problem though because like when you're a young person and you're going into a career of some kind which mm. is what you guys are encouraging people to do mm. um do they know their rights? Do they know what's right and what's wrong? And do, you know, because I think people do get exploited. It's not, and it's not just the younger generation, like mm. the ones that are leaving school. It's also that next tranche of of people, like in the twenties and yeah. early twenties yeah. and stuff like that. It's Every age group's got vulnerable people, I think. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, people with, you know, um, maybe, you know, learning difficulties, um, people that can be coerced into things. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's, that's, that is a fair point. When we, when we promote apprenticeships to our students, we are very clear as to what the model is. There is a training provider or a college. There is an employer. There is you as an apprentice. Um, with the literature that we send out, um, it has got employee rights and responsibilities, and we do... Um, parent information sessions because again this is really important to get that parent message through yeah. so we're, we're going to do parent information sessions with the western training provider network in north somerset ask apprenticeships in somerset they're going to come in and host these gigs at our schools and we'll send the information home so we do everything we can to make sure that the what the model of apprenticeships is the correct model um, yeah. is made very clear so families can understand and also um, it goes without saying because apprenticeships are about searching and applying for a vacancy. It's not a given. It's not going to land in your lap. And a lot of our students that come to us say, I'm not going to go to college. That's too hard. I'm going to do an apprenticeship instead. I'm like, bless you, mate. Um, because it's a full time job with a thing on top, you know. Yeah. yeah. But um, but we make sure that those students, um, if they're showing an interest in apprenticeships, that they've applied for a full time alternative at college anyway, just in case it gets to September, because we don't want them dropping off and out. Um, it's a legal requirement staying, you know, education, training and um, and development um, until they're 18. Um, so we make sure they've got a full time place at college if for whatever reason the apprenticeship doesn't manifest itself. It's, and 
coming back, you touched on it earlier and we kind of didn't go down that line, but I just wonder if we could come back to that, that bit about, you said about people's mental health, mm. young people's mental health and, mm -hmm. and that impact of change and being able to survive or not survive, family dysfunctions, family, you know, all of that stuff. How I, does that... I was just going to add to that and say, I guess that also links to a question I wanted to ask around about young people who have absolutely no idea what they want to do. Mm. And be perhaps because of some of those barriers or issues mm -hmm. around mental health and things like that. Because we, we're, a, we're a mental health charity, so we try to support people. So it's great to kind of get your views on mm. how, how you support people with those things. We work really closely across our schools with other stakeholders and organizations because we can't claim to be experts in everything. Um, if, if we do, then we're making fatal errors and that's when things are going to land on their ass. Um, you know, um, so we work very closely with the SEN teams, um, the safeguarding and welfare teams at our schools. Um, so everything links if there's a student that's displaying any kind of, um, um, you know, activity or behavior that we need to be aware of. We speak to parents really carefully. So stepping out of school and into college or sit form is a big deal. So anybody that needs that additional help, instead of just throwing everyone into a, into a room and saying, right, crack on, um, yeah. we'll, make, um, we'll make invisible allowances for students. Everyone feels like they get the same service because no one likes to be ring fenced and, and annexed. Um, no one wants to be different. No, exactly. Um, so we put everyone on the same big pedestal. Um, but we'll reach out to local colleges and sit forms. We'll speak to them. We'll make sure that the transition and support is in place. Um, our local colleges and sit forms are brilliant at that. Um, so we've got easy communication. For example, uh, our looked after children. Um, we've got coordinators in our schools. So we make sure that they get given an extra layer of um, help and support. Um, but yeah, mental health is a massive issue amongst young people, across, again, across all demographics, isn't it? Um, so we try and instill a sense of fun, a sense of positive participation. Um, as a side hustle, I'm a qualified solution-focused hypnotherapist. I don't really use it with the students, but the theory is there about how the brain works and how we respond to when we feel like we're in danger or a threat and how we respond and how we can counter that. So in a weird way, I use it all the time when I'm speaking to students by approaching questions in a slightly different way. But yeah, the world is scary. Um, the world, it, you know, it, it prompts anxiety. So we try and make things as not light and fluffy, but as fun and as participatory as possible to take that fear away um, as best we can. Um, but yeah, um, it's, it is a big deal. We work really closely with stakeholders just to make sure you know, I think um, Dawn Carey from In Charlie's Memory, she's like chair of governors at TCASA now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're well, we're well kind of connected with all sorts of support groups. I, and because that also then brings up another question for me, because it's like, it's very easy to go down a path. I mean, my background is mental health, acute mental health, working with people who've been abused and also where organization organizational abuse as well where actually we don't differentiate between what we've we're kind of forced down a certain path children are forced down a certain path and and it's a little bit like you said the careers officer that's stuck in the in the desk underneath the stairs and you know kind of dismissed slightly by everybody and really oh it's it's a requirement of the government to do that Ooh. and in a sense that surely has that same impact in other you know we know we've got it right we're in actual fact we haven't got it right we don't know that we've got it right you don't know you've got it right until 10 years down the line and that kid comes back and says you got it really wrong mm -hmm. and and okay. and that's the responsibility of people that work in schools isn't it Absolutely. Um, there, there is one significant measurement tool that we use to confirm kind of what we do and its impact, and that's our NEAT figures. So the students that leave our care at 16, um, I think the regional and national average is something like awfully 10% of 16 year olds don't progress to college education training um, as a next step. At our schools, I, and I, I'm so proud of this, and this isn't me, this is everybody working together. I think in two of our schools were less than 1% and in wow. the third less than two. Um, and we could name those kids specifically as to the reason why and all of the extra help that was offered to them after they left us. And it's ongoing. It's a, our careers offer is life for life. Anyone can yeah, come yeah. back and ask us. Um, it's fantastic. 
that's that's a measurement tool but like you said angie it's like 10 years down the line um it's but what we are here to do is facilitate that next step that next appropriate step so we don't shoehorn anyone anywhere because that's that's doomed to fail um we help them take that next appropriate step and i'll jump back with what you asked me earlier on mike about um talking to students that have no idea what they want to do um so it's the next appropriate step and then we hand them over to that next step provider with their own kind of resources and support networks and we cherish them pass them on and make sure that they are looked after and in turn and turn and turn it's the best it's the best we can do with safeguarding in place um, with welfare in place with everything that we do um but in terms of how we work with the students to have no clue those are the people that i find most fascinating because they already know they just don't realize they know they're telling yeah. themselves they don't know um because exploring weird abstract concepts of careers if their parents are unhappy in their jobs or don't work or um they just don't have the confidence or the belief in themselves to explore all options or they just gain too much um uh then those are the conversations that are brilliant and that's why i'm a big believer in this little and often approach with our stakeholders it's the same with the kids there is no point again this is old school there is no point in getting a student in for an hour for a careers interview and we're going <laughs> to crash it we've got 60 minutes to figure it out timmy and after that 60 minutes i'm going to i'm going to stamp a job title on the back of your hand Job that's, it. Yeah. That's, yeah. It. that's it you know lockdown in 10 years time you might come looking for me <laughs> but, <laughs> right, it's yeah, about... that's what happened when I was at school not that I ever went to school because I didn't because I suppose there's another side of it which is those kids that drop out of education that mm. sadly you guys you know what what happens you know I, I mean I I there's a young lady that I I know quite well and she hasn't been to school for two years and it's like yeah. that's so sad it's so so challenging we do everything we possibly can everything yeah. we possibly can and more um yeah but, but the... people are using this we're homeschooling mm. well, i know that kid's not getting any homeschooling nobody's bloody schooling her at all it certainly is certainly risen in the last couple of years i think the the perception of what full-time education is means and parent kind of buy-in I think has been shaken by the events of the last few years um and um yeah it, it is it is a challenge it is a challenge um you know attendance is a greater focus than ever now at school because we want it, research has shown us that when the children would you believe it when the children come to school they do better <laughs> what, who would have guessed <laughs> what man's statistician cooked that one up but yeah the more they're in the the greater level of success and for some students just being in puts them in a safer place yeah, yeah. than yes. if they're not so it's not even about attainment it's about basic safeguarding and welfare um they're with their peers they're in a protected environment they have food and warmth and light um whereas some of those young people may not have that at home so you know <laughs> And I identify with that. I mean, I came from a very poor background with nothing and it wasn't a very pleasant environment to live in. And going to school to a certain degree was a bit of a salvation. Even though I had challenges at school, I'd Ooh. rather have been at school than been at home. And Ooh. I think sometimes it it's recognising that that is the concept for some children and some young people. They actually want to be there because the school represents safety for them. And yeah. very often people don't recognize that in, in, in the school environment, do they? It's, it's a funny one. I mean, I, it's, it's, I, it warms my heart that in the mornings I see our staff out the front of school meeting and greeting the kids as they come in, because that could possibly be the nicest thing that student has seen or heard yeah. since they left school the previous day. Yeah. To be greeted on the doorstep, how are you? Come on in. And we encourage our teachers to be at the door of their classrooms and tutors to be at the door you know, greeting and ushering the students in, come in, come in, you know, good to see you. How are you today? Um, straighten your tie, tuck your shirt in. Um, but, and, and, <laughs> and all those things, you know, um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's about, it's about showing kindness, about having boundaries, you know, um, they're, yeah. here to, they're here to learn and behave and follow our behavior policy, but it's just showing kindness, a bit of warmth, a bit of happiness, enthusiasm, a bit of joy, dare I say it. You know? Wells, Wells Blue School, my, I, I only know this because my daughter lives in Westbury Submendip and um, her boys potentially will go to that school. And uh, when they, 
they actually reward the children. So if you come into school with your tie straight, your jacket on or whatever the, whatever it is, they'll give you, um, you personally, it's not house points. It doesn't go mm. to the house. It goes to the individual and they mm. get given like a token okay. and these, and they can add these tokens up and then they can buy things from the school shop as in, that might be a cinema ticket. It might be sweeties. It might be a lunch. It can be anything, a, a mm. new school tie, whatever. But, yeah. And I thought, how lovely to see things in that sense rather than that punitive sense, which is what a lot of kids have experienced and do experience even today at school, where your skirt's too short. You know, their skirts are always going to be too short. Get over it. Do you know what I'm saying? I, it, when I was at school all those years ago, Every girl's skirt was too short. You know, every boy wanted to not wear his tie properly and have it hanging down by his belly button. It's normal, I think. But I just love that concept of reward in a positive manner to the individual rather than it being a collective reward. Because let's face it, who wants a house point? (laughs) Harry Potter. Um, I was was thinking that as well, Harry Potter. Oh, Michael Gambon. Rest in peace. Um, Absolutely. Yes, but um, but yeah, you, you're you're right. It, you know, it's it's positive reinforcement. But and and you also you are absolutely right, Angie. We are we are designed. We're programmed to test boundaries, aren't we? We're, we're there to. We're if if we're not there to test boundaries and break rules, then from a parent to child point of view, nothing will ever improve. We'll never get better at anything. That's what we're for: is to be yeah. better and and do things, you know, differently from what came before. Yeah. So absolutely, 100% agree with you. And so, okay, what do you do in your other life? For three days a week, I look after the careers offer of the Priory Learning Trust. No, hold on, no, I'm wrong. For two days a week, I look after the careers offer of the Priory Learning Trust. For three days a week, um, I am a careers advisor at Priory School. Um, then for another day a week, um, I do stuff on LinkedIn and engage with businesses and stakeholders and um, sing the praises of the trust and help a bit of recruitment. Um, for another day a week, um, I am um, I'm, I'm a husband and a dad, and I look after my family. Um, from another day a week, um, I don't really do the hypno thing anymore, although I do do it every now and again to help people. Um, I do a little bit of writing, um, a little bit of this and that. I've got a couple of books from back in the day, and I'm struggling with writing my third. Um, um, and for another day a week, um, I watch movies and eat chocolate all day. <laughs> Sounds great. You seem to have eight days in your well, week. I thought I counted nine, oh, but you? yeah. <laughs> Can I have your world, please? It, it's a it's a matter of positive mental attitude. That's what it is. <laughs> there's, there's this thing that I read about last year, and it really, really resonated me, with me. It was um, it was a Greek philosopher um, had a had a theory of time. And there is Kronos, and I'm going to Angelos, our principal here, is going to correct me on pronunciation. There's Kronos, and that's the the inevitable ticking of time. There's nothing you can do about that. And then there was, I think it's like Kairos, which is if you do things, significant things in a certain pattern and a certain frequency, you can actually, in some weird way, slow time down. It's like it's like that day when it just drudges by and you don't do anything and then it's over before you know it. And then there's the other day when you can do a million things and it's only lunchtime. Um, yeah, that's it. I've, I've mastered the secret to time travel. That's what it is. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And if you saw yourself now, like when you left school, bearing in mind what, you know, would you have thought that you would be where you are today? Or not, are you where you wanted to be as well? Not in a million, million years. I came here to Priory School for my last year of schooling because I grew up in Ireland and I got dragged over to here by my fingernails by my family. Um, for good intentions, um, it was for welfare and finance and all sorts. But at the time, I took it very personally. So I did one year here, and I, 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 I hated it. Hated primary school because I was here and I didn't live down by my little lake by the sea in the countryside, a, a million miles away. Um, that's such a chip on my shoulder. Um, and from that point onwards, I had a real issue with education. Even though I did A levels, then we took A levels, then I did a degree in psychology. I still hated education with a chip on my shoulder. Really <laughs> weird. Um, to think that my 15 year old self, to think that I'd be back here working here for eight years, I would have laughed in my own face. Um, but actually there's this 
there's this philosophy theory in careers practice called planned happenstance that basically if you put yourself in a certain situation with a certain context and a certain attitude you you can influence the world around you and, and help other people it's really hard work it takes a lot of um emotional and mental energy um that's actually what it's all about um everything from that point to here is uh, planned happenstance kind of in and out of my control but i shouldn't be anywhere else other than where i am here this is a best destiny kind of thing because i'm here with an emotional attachment to my school um with a million years worth of employer contacts from my online work and recruitment days um with a insight and a perspective that is kind of a little bit unique that helps the kids that helps the staff that helps the community that helps local businesses because i do sideline recruitment for them in my free time because i'm sad i don't charge a fee anymore I could retire on the earnings if i charge but i won't um but yeah it's all about plan happens about that it's being about where you should be um and making good of that when you are and that's where i am wow and do I you that. yeah i do too do you feel that sometimes you'd like your colleagues or other people to have that same attitude? I think everyone's everyone goes to work for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Everyone goes to work for different reasons. You know, um, people um, work really hard, um, work really smartly, work for great results. Some people martyr themselves and don't do nearly as much work because they're too busy martyring themselves in front of in front of an audience. Um, so yeah, ev- ev- everyone is different. Um, I, I don't judge other people like that because we all work um, for different reasons. Um, yeah, I just I, th- I throw myself into it. I have boundaries. I'm I'm not. I haven't got a messiah syndrome or anything like that. Um, absolutely not. Um, but yeah, um, I throw I throw it all in there because why not? Why not? Um, Are you want... sh- Come on, let's get let's be honest here. Have you got angel wings that sit on the back in, in your airing cupboard sometimes because you don't judge people? Because don't we all judge to a certain degree? I form opinions. I don't want to judge. Isn't that the same? No. <laughs> informed, <laughs> inform, informed, informed opinions based on uh, many years of being a professional careers practitioner in, you know, entit- entitles me to inform opinions, not judgment. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. not at all. Our, ours is a reflective practice. It's really, really important that as a careers advisor, you step back. Therapy isn't, we're not quite therapists, but we are counselors. Um, it's really important that we step back and keep a clear view of things because otherwise, you know, that's when the judgment creeps in. That's when the stereotypes click, kick in. And that's when we vanish under the stairs to be one of them old school careers advisors. I think it's really important. And I do that a lot is just to stop and think. And, you know, it's the problem of mind, putting yourself in other people's shoes. And I do that as much as I can with like CPD and speaking to different kinds of people and asking questions um, and listening. That's the important thing, isn't it? You've got to listen to people. It's easy to sit, sit there and people watch and make judgments. But if you people watch and actually listen to what people are saying, that's really, really fascinating because that's multi-layered. But yeah. For sure. Yeah, and you can learn so much from people as well. But we, we do judge each other. Yes, it's true. It's, it's a fact. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to think that I do not. Um, but what can you do? No, no one wants to admit that. Nah. We don't. No, you'd right. And it's like a bit like one of the things for being a therapist is that bit about unconditional positive regard being non-judgmental. But Exactly. I'm not being funny, but I judge people. Of course I do. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. And as soon as somebody walks in a room, I kind of make an evaluation, whether it's good, bad or indifferent, you make an evaluation of that person. And then I'm, I'd like to think I'm open minded enough to be able to say, you know, to put that to one side of and course. have a relationship with that person. But I don't think that always happens with everybody, but it, it, it does happen. I correct myself. If I feel if I feel like judgment kicking in, like you said, if someone walks in the room and I kind of think, ooh. I correct myself and and tell myself, I wonder how this is going to play out. Yeah, you know, yeah, to, yeah. To make, yeah no, exactly. Make it, make it curious rather than judgy. Um, exactly. But yeah, I, I tell my team and encourage my team to kind of um, stop and backtrack, reflect, seek supervision, ask for help. There's no, there's no, there's no harm in a one to one or in a parent conversation actually saying, I think we need to leave it there. Um, I need to seek, I need to reflect on what we're talking about, and I'll come back to you tomorrow because when emotions kick in and things like that, I think then we can end up going down the blind side. Um, but yeah, it's important as, as counselors that we can stop it by having those boundaries. Otherwise, yes, yeah, savior syndrome, Messiah syndrome, whatever you want to call it, it that's, that's risky territory in our line of work. 
because you're I'm sure yeah because you can't you know yeah. people can only save themselves at the end of the day and i know that's a bit of a cliche but it is true you know with the right support though they can get that and it's funny because we do a lot of work with young people an awful lot of work with young people who actually don't want the school to know anything about it which is always an interesting position to be in is like well why don't you want the school to know mm. about what you're doing and why you're coming to us for help and stuff we but sometimes you just can't ask the question they just don't feel that they've got the anonymity through school so that they come to an outside and you know outside of school to get that support and I always find that a bit strange really but it's a bit like kids seeking for help away from their parents mm. you No, know, we want to see somebody but we don't want our mum and dad to know about it that's always a tough one as well yeah, compartmentalization, isn't it? But yeah, it, the the safeguarding staff that I know at not just in our own trust, but everywhere, they are they are ridiculously dedicated. They are they're the ones with the wings um, because the stories they hear and things they see and conversations they have, man, yeah, they're they're they're, they're the ones that that need the um, need the blue Peter badges. Um, <laughs> what what we do in my team, we're a light touch, um, and if anything red flags, then we go to safeguarding and we hand it on in a way. Um, yeah, they're, they're the ones where the buck really stops with them. Um, it's the same with social workers, isn't it? You know, um, but um, but yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, I think young people are, again, it's a kind of a programming thing to keep things in in pockets. Um, you know, some young people have got different groups of friends to do different things with and they'll never merge them. Um, um, yeah, interesting. <laughs> well, cool. So on that note then, we, at the end of the, uh, every podcast, we um, we ask our guests, if they've got a goal or an aim that they've got for the next 12 months, because we try and get our guests to come back uh, okay. in about a year's time and see if they've achieved the goal that they've, they've set themselves. All right. Thank you for that. Damn it. <laughs> um, I'd love to come back. Um, all right. Amazing. Goals, unrealistic goals um, that I'm going to set myself now. I want to do more travel um, on my own. I did a bit of traveling um, since, since before I was a teenager um, on my own this year, and I'm going to do it again over the next 12 months. Um, I want to write a third book. I want to, I want to in paper publish all of the 13 books that the Priory kids have written and published in the past as eBooks. I want to stand in the library with the actual physical copies that other children can borrow and read. Um, and I just want to keep trucking along. I just want to be happy. Um, I want to keep balance. Balance is really important. Um, I want to keep balanced and yeah, just keep doing good stuff. Good. Cool. Well, thank good. you so much yeah, for coming thanks. on. It's been really good fun. You're a star. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. And you're going to help out with the Dragon's Den thing at Priory in a few weeks' time. Um, yeah. That's going to be such good fun. I'm really, it's, it's going to be a lot more structured um, this year, um, but no less scary for the students because, like we said, it's about testing is, comfort zones and stuff. Is there, are there going to be samples this year? Samples? Were there yeah. samples? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was the pizza thing. I don't know. I'll, 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 I'll ask, year? I don't know. Um, I, I, I should. Um, I don't. Um, I'll find <laughs> out and I'll let you know. Could, could you push it towards chocolate? <laughs> something something consumable. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I will do Amazing. It. Cool. We'll end it there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, good fun.